Hey guys, Ben Ostervelt here with the Business From Within podcast. This is Ben Ostervelt here. This is our first podcast that we are putting out for Business From Within. The idea of this podcast is to talk to people and go within their business to as, as vulnerable as they'll let us know and find out what really goes on inside their business. But really, that's not really the purpose, even though we'll hear some cool, freaking awesome business stuff. The real purpose is to go within the business owner and find out what are the things that have held them back personally, how personal breakthrough has actually caused them to be more successful, find out about self-sabotages. So much business right now is just business planning, strategies, online, all this such, it's okay, but on its own, it's bullshit. Because why are not everybody successful? Like why is not everyone making millions of dollars? It's personal sabotage. So I'm gonna tell my stories. I failed lots of my life. I've had lots of, lots of challenges. I've had a tough life. But what makes me successful and why I sold 440 grand in my first year of real estate, I had 61 properties, I had millions of dollars of real estate. I'm a team lead, a business coach. Like I've got a lot of cool stuff. When I even sold office furniture, I sold two and a half million dollars of desks one year. And at the end of the day, the more authentic, the more real I become, the more I get really honest with who I really am, the more success chases me. And I can't explain the difference between strategy versus kind of the law of attraction. It sounds a little bit fluffy, but it has to come into play. So anyways, I'll tell you a little bit of my story. So before I you know, got successful and, and hit cool marks in life, I grew up in a family that you know, my, my great grandpa was actually in the war in a torture camp when he was in, in, in the military. And they, they, I, I don't know, it's a crazy story. You know, he stole a sheep or something for his family. And then they, you know, the Nazis grabbed him and put him in a concentration camp. And they started cutting off his toes and crazy stuff. So with that, then he leaves the war and he has to raise children. Probably not the nicest man. Probably got some things messed up. So he raised my grandpa and my grandpa raised my dad and my dad raised me. Every generation, it got less, but it was not a nurturing environment. It was, it was the opposite. My dad was, um, he's a really good dude. He's a really good dude. I love him dearly. I feel like he just had this, you know, if it's poker analogy, it's like a seven and two thrown at him and he had to play poker and try to win. He had his issues. But in a weird way, when we're in life, I feel like, I feel like whatever you, the hand you get dealt is perfect. So I'm never a victim. That's step one. Never be a victim. It's, you can't blame someone. Even if you got, like I got, I got beaten up. I got just psychologically put down. I got, it was so much, it was a very tough environment, but you know what? It's perfect. I wouldn't be sitting here on camera talking. So I feel like maybe there's a bit of destiny in shaping me. I just feel like we need to embrace the road versus blame and, and not, and just say, oh, I need to change this. Now, what if you embrace the problems versus fighting the problems? Anyways, that's now, you know, 37 years old. Like, I know that now. I didn't think that. I started running away from home when I was 12. I, was, I, I realized I don't want to become like my family, my dad. So it's kind of almost mature for my age, but I didn't fit in. School sucked. I was just ADD probably. I've never got a check down because I think I don't want to. Probably dyslexic. Didn't want to check that out either. Didn't read. I hated sitting still. I still hate sitting still. I might have to bounce around here for a minute. But the thing is, I didn't fit in school. And every time you go to school, if you don't get an A, then you're, you're almost like just not as good as everyone. So it just reinforced my home life. I didn't feel very valuable. And at school, they just say, oh, you, you know what? You suck at school. And that was, the, that was the line that you set for the rest of your life. The school sets which grade you are against everyone. So you go through your whole entire life grading yourself against everyone. It's like set your whole belief system. Anyways, I could talk all day about how stupid school is. But yeah, I ran away from home, started living on the streets. I found a crew that, that really accepted me and they were drug addicts. And so I found a way to find my first crew, my first group. And uh, finally, it was the first time I actually felt loved. And I didn't know what love was. It wasn't real love, but it was like this feeling of that people liked me. When I'm going all in, it was kind of extreme. So I went all in. I would, I would actually do drugs and party through the whole week. My friends would show up on the weekends and I'd still be doing drugs and still be. And I got all in and they liked me. So living on the streets and it was crazy. And my parents, I don't know, I probably put my parents through a shit ton. They, 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 they had no clue how to raise me when I'm doing that kind of stuff. But yeah, it was crazy. I used to steal, I used to slide two, six bottles up my sleeve and steal from liquor stores. I used to bag on the streets. And it just like, there's, I just wanted to die every single day. Like every day, I'm like, why am I living? 
And why am I living? And I just wanted someone to like me. I just wanted someone to just love me. And I didn't know what that meant. I was told through Christianity that Jesus loves you. And as a kid, I didn't know what that meant. Like, it just was so abstract. Like, no, no, you're, you're, you're broken, and thank goodness you have Jesus. And it was like this weird side effect when you're an insecure person thinking you're worthless, and then they reinforce it saying you're worthless, but don't worry, Jesus loves you. And it's like this imaginary character that's supposed to talk to you and never talks to you. So this weird religious dynamic growing up too. And, uh, and that's another thing I can talk about. But anyways, got into crime. I met some people. When you're insecure, you, track, you, you actually attract yourself. In, the, in my theory, is you attract who you are. So today I have an amazing team. In my real estate, I've got amazing friends, and I feel like it's because I'm attracting good people. So if you're not a victim, you can actually take credit too. Be like, hey, I'm kind of creating a cool life now. But again, that's the end of the story. Anyways, see, um, I met a guy, his name was Alan, and this guy was 18, I was 15, and he started showing me the ropes. So he saw me how, I think psychologically, he knew I was insecure and I needed a friend and he needed to use me. So he, he taught me how to do fraud, how to like cash checks and get money, uh, taught me how to forge signatures. And one day he goes, let's, let's go to Vegas. I'm like, sure, I'm in. This finally someone likes me, he's my friend. He taught me how to go to my dad's, get a credit card receipt. Got the credit card receipt, which had the number on it. I don't know if that's how it is now. Then what we did was we went to a travel agency. It was like way pre 9-11. We could never do this now. Went to a travel agency and he was good with the ladies. So he had this one lady and he was flirting with her like crazy. And he, we came up with this story that we're going to Disneyland. My dad's on business. He's meeting us down there and we're flying down. We're going to meet him in Vegas and he's going to pick us up. Somehow she believed us. And they're like, well, we need, we need some kind of letter from your dad. I don't know why they didn't call. I guess so stupid. So we forged it. We put it up against the windows, forged his signature and says the story of what's going to happen. She goes, yeah, this is good. She booked the flights, booked everything for us, gave us tickets. I'm 15 years old. Then we went, now, next thing you know, we're, we go to Vegas. So we have no money. We have a credit card number. Just like, what? So we went to Vegas. Uh, we stayed in our hotel because we got a package deal. He was 18. So I don't even know how that worked, actually. Because in the stage, you're 21. He probably just had a fake ID. Anyways, we ran out of like, our, like we had no food. You know, and we, and we saw that you could buy hookers. Or oh, this is wicked. They're like magazines. You just open a magazine. You call a girl. This is awesome. We got a credit card number. Let's bring some girls over. And so we were like, this is the best place in the world. We call. And obviously a credit card number is not good enough to get a hooker. So thank goodness we didn't do that. So we thought it was so cool. But then what happened was he had this idea because our flights were coming back. I don't know how we survived, to be honest. I think we just ordered in a lot and uh, did the credit card number over the phone. And the, the guys would drop off the food. And so that's how we fed ourselves. And after about four days, it's time to go home. So he convinced me. He says, hey, look, why don't you stay here? Okay, I'm coming back. And you stay here. I don't even know what I was thinking. I'm like, okay, sounds good. So anyways, I'm 15 years old. He flies home. I literally don't have a hotel, no money, nothing. And I'm sitting there in Vegas. And I'm like, what do I do? Now, all of a sudden, I'm not a, I'm not a gangster anymore. I'm not a tough ass guy that I, I would always present myself as. I was a little boy. So I didn't know what to do. I got so scared. I didn't know what to do. So I went to the MGM Grand Hotel. I went to the information and said, I got left here. I'm from Canada. I need to use your phone, please. I'm trying to find my way home. So all my life, I've been very innovative and creative and the ability to communicate. So I got, somehow I talked myself into getting to the back room. So I, so I call and guess what day it was? It was Christmas Eve. So I'm trying to find people. I just got to get home. Call my parents. No one's around. I don't know where they are. I, at this point, I think my dad had even told my brother that I was dead. I was just absolutely wild. Just wild. He didn't know what to do. He, my brother, seven years older, sort of seven years younger, and he just didn't know what to do. He really didn't know what to do. I was just crazy, violent sometimes, and angry and lost. But I was this little boy in Vegas. So what happened was I got a hold of this guy. His name was Chuck. He was an ex-biker, and he's from the church. And I so I called Chuck. He was the only guy. There was two people. A guy named Dave Pettit. He always looked out for me. And then this guy here was an ex-biker. And he'd always take me for breakfast. He knew I was a lost kid. It was really cool. That was, those are two really cool people in my life. He ended up dying, having a heart attack. But when I talked to Chuck, he goes, Ben, I can't help you. I got no money. He's probably smart too. Street smart. He's like, I'm not helping him. But couldn't get through there. I, I call my uncle Henry and I find out your dad is at the Sheraton Hotel in Calgary. They're on their holiday, Christmas holiday. I said, okay, good. Thank you. Click. Jumped on the phone again. I called the hotel and the hotel guy goes, yeah, the Ostervelds are here. So I said, okay. I said, can I talk to him? I get on the phone. My dad and mom have no clue where I am. Christmas Eve, they have no clue who I am. Just living wherever I do. Hey, dad. 
hey, I, was, I got stuck in Vegas. He has no clue that he paid for the entire trip. So he's like, I got stuck in Vegas. He's like, what? Like, what are you going to do? Like, he's obviously going to take care of my, his son. And he just booked a flight. And I flew back and had Christmas Day with them. About a month later, my dad is livid. He got his bill. Full sheet of Vegas cost thousands. We spent flights and everything. He puts me in the car. He goes, come on, let's go. Brings me to the police station. I'm 15, but I was cocky. I was like, you know what? When you're too hard on a kid, eventually it's just fuck you to life. Like, you know what? What are you going to do? Hurt me again? What are you going to keep doing this to me? So I was beyond cocky, which is just a barrier to protect a little boy that's terrified inside. That's what that is. I go into the police station. So cocky. My dad's trying to scare me. It's probably a good move, to be honest. But he, um, so I sat down with this police officer and he tries to intimidate me. I looked at him and I'm like, what are you going to do? I'm underage. And he just was trying to scare me. I just, fuck you. Like, what are you going to do? Throw me in jail. Fuck you. And then they, they took me home. It didn't work. And I, and I think they kicked me out. And I lived on the streets again and figured it out. So these are the things that my parents had to deal with, which is like, couldn't imagine. Even though they had parts to play in it, it's just like amazing to what parents have to go through with kids like that. They have, how do you do that? Anyways, from that point, I was a good hard worker. Like I just was like, I'd work hard and I, I just wanted people to like me. So I learned how to work hard and I got jobs and it's pretty innovative for a drug addict and more of a hurting kid than a drug addict. Really, I'd do anything. I'd put anything into my system. I remember throwing up on the ground and it was just pure, bright, fluorescent green. I drank so much. It was just like laying in the middle of the street, throwing up. Anyways, another thing is I, I rented an apartment with a buddy. It was just a gross apartment. And we lived there. Now, here's the crazy story. I woke up one day. So we, had, we were doing coke. We had mushrooms. We had smoking pot, drinking, like whatever we had. Thank goodness the chemicals weren't really that ravage. Because that'd be crazy what's out there right now. That was pretty... Craziest thing I did was you know, like heroin or, or even um, acid. But now it's like so many designer drugs. I'd be totally into that back then. But anyways, one day I was just so high. <clears throat> I was sitting down on, um, on the couch, tripping out. It was like, I don't even know what time it was, one in the morning or something. And something spoke to me. Like either it was a crazy trip for real or if it was real, but it doesn't matter. It's probably tripping. But it might be some kind of weird spiritual thing. It said, go home. Go see your family. I'm like, what? I was like 15 years old, 16 years old, or 17, I can't remember. Go, go home. So I don't remember, but I remember getting into a cab at two in the morning, and the cab driver knew me. This is very faint. And then he drove me. I said, go home. So I'm 2.30 in the morning. I'm standing in front of my parents' house. That's where they live today still. I'm standing there. And then he took off. So I knocked on their door, <laughs> and uh, my mom came down. My dad was done with me, like just done. My mom comes down. I sit down, and I start crying. I said, Mom, I've got lots of money. Throw a thousand bucks on the ground. I said, I, I, wanna, I don't want to do this anymore, Mom. I'm really high. Look at my eyes. They're, they're totally, I'm just so high right now. I want to change something. I, and because my other alternative, to be really honest, I don't ever share this really, but I was planning to kill people. I was planning to go out swinging. Like I would just fantasize about it all the time. I never share this ever on camera. But I used to be, just be so angry that I just wanted to die. I had tried suicide. I got stories about escaping from a psychiatric ward as a kid and, and running around and like just my life was so hard. And, but I, rem I just wanted, I thought I'm going to kill my family. It was crazy. Like where was that kid's head? Just a, it was just this hurting boy inside. But there was something that just wanted to live. I thought, okay, I'm going to give this one shot and then I'm going to go out. I'm going to freaking kill myself and kill some people. And so anyways, I went, my mom says, well, I think there's a place called Teen Challenge. So Teen Challenge is a Christian program. It has 700 centers around the world, and they've got high success rates, and there's one just outside of Calgary. What's crazy is the only reason my mom knows that is that they came, these drug addict guys were in this program, and they had a choir back in the day. So I was maybe like, I don't know, 10 or 8, and my parents billeted a whole bunch of drug addicts from Teen Challenge because they came to the choir, and the church would say, hey, who can take some of these guys? My parents took them. So they had this connection with this place, which is like, if they didn't, I don't know where I'd be. So anyways, I, the next few days, I jumped, I went 365 days in a rehab center. From the age of 17, I turned 18 years old in a rehab center. I'd already been to rehabs. I've already, like, it was insane. I was way older for my age. You would never know. I was hanging out with 20-year-olds when I was 15. And so there's this, just went through this place where I'd have to wake up in the morning. I'd have to have to shower. And you'd have to go read the Bible for like half an hour. It's so religious. 
And then I'd have to go, we'd eat breakfast, but if you're on duty of chores, you have to do chores. After breakfast, you do more schooling. And it's like religious schooling. Like I'm talking like it might even look like a cult to someone. I was desperate. Like I thought, and that's all I knew was Christianity as a kid. So anyways, they do, they put you to work through the half of the day. In the evening, you might get an hour free time. And you're doing studies, you're doing this. And, and it's 365 days on a ranch. And I did it. And I totally changed my life. It, it got me to a place where I was somewhat normal. The one thing that it was missing was, again, it was all about you're a broken person, so you need Jesus versus like I'm, I'm perfect. I'm built well. You just need to discover. You got to be yourself. Like you're already built perfectly. Just be yourself. That's more what I believe. So that's why I came still lacking massive confidence, low value, had lots of issues, but I wasn't a drug addict. So I didn't know what to do with my life. So I ended up going to Bible college because that's obviously what helped me. So I'll go to Bible college and I had already spoken in like 80 churches. I, I became the leader of all the PR and the, in there as a student, I used to take teams and go speak at churches and go join the sharing testimonies, raising money for the place. But anyways, I went to Bible college and um, it sucked so bad. It was like these little Christian goody goods that were like, I'm going to be a pastor. I'm going to be a minister. Like, it's like, I don't even know if they even thought for themselves. Can't say that about everybody, but I'm like, look, guys, I want to know about this God thing. Like, I was really serious and nobody was like, everyone's just like, let's do this. When I, like, so I quit halfway through. I'm like, this is not my thing. I don't fit it. I've always been very raw and real, which is somewhat intimidating. Didn't feel I fit in there. It was not raw and real. It was just, just they're just kids at Bible college. So I left, started getting into it about a year. Or so I started working, started getting into it with my mom and dad again. So none of the real issues were really dealt with. It was just like uh, 365 days, you, you learn some stuff. But so anyways, I, I moved to Calgary <clears throat> to get away from my parents because it was bad. Started falling back into my ways a bit. Now, this is the craziest story ever, okay? So if it's, I don't even care. But so I'm in Calgary. I'm, I'm working concrete, making good money, living at my aunt's house and on a cot in the office. Uh, financed a truck for 27%. Like it just, I look back, I'm like, geez, I bought a truck. It's like 27% financing. I'm like, yep, take it. Just, just no wisdom, no understanding. Those are those self-sabotages. That's the stuff that I didn't even know what to do. One day, uh, one day I'm thinking, cal- really calculating to go start using again and really start getting back on drugs and drinking and just start partying again. Just started feeling depressed and upset. Like whatever was in there wasn't dealt with. It was just separated for a while. And so anyways, what happened was one night, it's kind of weird me sharing this, cause, but I don't care. The next day I was going to go use. And I had this audible voice yell at me. And it was no one there. It was a crazy thing. So I don't know if it was a spirit. I don't know if it was a ghost or if it was actually God or, or just my own crazy ability to fix my life. I have no clue. But something was like this. Imagine if you had a kid or someone you love that were just about to hit, get hit by a train and you could not push them out of the way. You would scream in desperation, watch out, because they, they had their earphones on or something, and you can't. You, and so what happened was I heard this, get out of Calgary, you're going to be destroyed, at like a scream. I instantly started bawling my brains out. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? So I'm crying like crazy, and I did not mess with it. I said, done. I called my uncle, uncle, can I come live with you? I'll, I'll, be, I'll work concrete with you. Yep, done. He was an awesome guy. So the next day, I'm, I went to, back to Edmonton. It was like this crazy thing. I didn't mess around. Like that was like scary. I just moved the next day. I'm like done. Quit my job. Quit everything. Never come back. It was so real. Now what's really interesting, it's kind of poetic, is this. So I've been married like 15, 16 years. How long? 16 years. And I love my wife. Like she is like, I just love her so much. What's so crazy is the day I got back to Edmonton, I called up my buddy, Chris. I said, Chris, let's go. I'm back. And he was kind of gangster a bit too. He's a good dude, but he wasn't, he was not polished at all. He, Anyways, I meet him at a coffee shop and he's sitting with this good, goody, good Christian girl named Renee. The next day, I end up meeting my wife. So I get this crazy experience in Calgary, come to Edmonton. Next day, I meet my wife hanging out with one of my old buddies. Ten months later, I was married to her. So it's kind of like so crazy. Like you'd like to think it's meant to be. Marriage is being absolutely super tough. Like it's like you're coming in with baggage. You're coming in with dysfunctions and self-sabotages and both of us have issues and it's just life. But, but uh, yeah, we're doing good now though. So I, I started to put myself back on track a little bit. I, I went back to Teen Challenge and I worked there for like two to three years with my wife. We had kids and, and it was like we kind of stabilized a little bit, but I never really dealt with too many of my issues. I still was insecure. I still wanted to be liked. It was just this undertone stuff that we bring into our lives that we don't really want to talk about really. Anyways, I quit, quit Teen Challenge and I found a job at Gunner Office Furnishings. It was, uh, I, they headhunted me. 
and I was really good at sales. I, I was about 10 years too young for the industry. Like their clients were like Husky, Imperial Oil, like big, big clients. And they would fully design furniture, do layouts. We'd work with interior designers. It wasn't just selling desks. It was like full consulting. I walked in there. I'm like, I actually called my dad. I said, dad, I'm going into sales. And he was like a top sales guy. He's like, here's what you do. And he told me. So I literally would call every single oil company in the entire city. Like, hey, do you want to buy some desks? And that's where I kind of got started getting polished in sales the hard way. And it was, I sold two and a half million dollars of office furniture. And I just, and I went, I was so, there was something driving me where I almost still didn't like my father. Now I know this. And what was driving me? So this is the business from within is it the, made the decisions that you make, they come from your shit and they come from your intuition and your brain. So there's this, this weird mix of everyone's got to make a decision. And so I'm like, you know what? I was so driven to be crazy rich. Now the background is my dad's a financial planner and I could never, I, I almost blamed him for everything because I, he never loved me the way I needed to. So I'd always carry that with me. Freaking guy. What a guy. Just, and he'd always be upset with my father. And, and so I went and I, I said, no, what? I'm going to build my own investment company. I didn't connect the dots till later. So I ended up quitting my job. I was killing it. And because I wanted, I found real estate investing and that's going to take me to the level I wanted to go. I never thought about happiness, never thought about anything. I just went into money, 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 money. But the thing is, I, I thought I was doing it for my family, but it wasn't true. Again, it was through this filter. And I'm, I was doing it for my dad because deep down, I didn't love who I was. And I really felt like I'd love who I was if my dad loved me, which is so effed up. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And it was, I bought 61 properties. No, I bought, sorry, what was it? At the end, I had 61 properties. Built a real estate investment company. And honestly, I was like, I was, I was killing it. And the market was going up with me, so it made me look really smart. We did half decent, built a company, and, uh, but I built in four different cities. I built so fast without having business experience that when the market turned, I was thin. And so I had built a company, and we bought 40 properties in 14 months with 27 investors. I had people working for me in, in a couple cities, and I was young. I was under, like, I was like, man, I made it. Like, it's millions of dollars of real estate, and it is flowing. Like, I had hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in my bank account all the time. So I, I just expanded, expanded, expanded. I bought, I think I own nine properties today. You know, it's like, just kept buying and refinancing. I leveraged to the absolute max. Again, no clue that that's probably not the best thing to do. So anyways, when the market turned in 2008, everything crashed. My business, I had lots of cash, and I went, holy crap, I'm, I'm on my way bankruptcy. But here's the thing, because I, I didn't have income coming in anymore. I just had cash and just shrinking and nobody wants to invest. So you're like, holy crap. Anyways, the, the couple side things was during that, because of insecurity and not believing in who I was, like I had set up a business that was really good. But then I thought I'm, I'm not that smart or, or I, I need to bring someone else in. So I had someone that I knew who was a multimillionaire. They just sold their business, but they had never done my business, but I brought them in to help me. She told me I need to do change this in my bookkeeping, change this in my accounting, change this, this. I just said, okay, 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 okay. But deep down, if I would have listened to my soul, I would never have taken that advice. I, I had the structure built. It screwed up my accounting so bad that, that the, the investors were all good, but I didn't know where I was at. And eventually I had to cut her out and she turned back to this day. She won't speak to me. Uh, and she's, the, she, the, the stuff that was said behind my back was brutal. It was part of the darkest times I've ever had in my life. And I've had a lot of dark times. 20 some people's money. Everyone's saying, hey, I want my money out. And I'm like, well, you bought property. And being a person that's a people pleaser going through this, like I didn't know that they chose to invest as well. But I put it 100% on me, which then started putting it on my family. And I know that now, but I was the worst husband, the worst dad. I had moved because of cost. I moved my office into the living room. Like it just, just didn't get it. This is what it happens when you have your own insecurities and you, have, you don't have the value, you don't have smarts to, it's more, it's more value. Like I made bad moves that put people in place that I thought that were better than me instead of just going, I could do this. Anyways, long story short, well, I'll tell you a story. One day I'm sitting at my desk and I was crying, just desperate. I didn't know what to do. I'm talking millions of dollars of people's money and they're stuck in real estate. And I'm going, I, I literally can't find investors now. And I'm like, holy crap. And I deeply love my family, even though I was not serving them at all. So I, said, so I didn't know what to do. So I went to Christianity again. I said, I know what to do. I'm going to pray. It's not so bad. You know, I think prayers in all kinds of different forms it could be meditation, it could be silence, whatever. So, so I, so I thought, but back in the day, it was very Christian. So what I did was I fasted and prayed for 30 days to hear God. And I'm, I'm telling you, I took Christianity to the series to the nines. In a weird way, it really worked. So a couple of things happened during that fast. 
I think it's not Christianity. It's the fact that I went into silence and, and I needed to go within, I needed to find the answer from within. I think religion just kind of packages it all differently, but it's just all inside you. So I went within and I'm sitting at my desk crying. I just didn't know what to do. I got other investors that want to sue me because this person that I brought on that I fired now is going to investors and lying to them and saying bad things about me. Like Ben, you know what? He's going to like, so they were coming at me. They were threatening to go to like securities and different things like that. Like, so I didn't know that I probably was totally safe. I was just terrified. The pressure was so high. Every day I wake up, just pressure, pressure, pressure. And so what I did was I, I was, I was crying on my desk. I don't know what to do. And I had this vision. All of a sudden it's like, I'm in this vision. And I'm just like, I was in the ocean and I was so, it was dark and I was going deeper and deeper and deeper. And what happened was the pressure was going higher and higher and higher. And instantly it was like this, it was like I was being taught. It's like, hey, you see how much pressure is there, Ben? I'm like, yeah. Now lean into the pressure. Everything inside you will tell you to run from the pressure. Run from that pain because you're going you're, you're gonna to explode. But I was so deep that the pressure was so high. And then it was almost like this little voice that says, you're not going to be here again. This is your only chance. And then it hit me. Ah, all the sunken ship's gold is at the bottom of the ocean but no one has the gonads to go get it. And I'm like, holy shit, it's time to learn. And so I leaned in and I saw myself, it was black. I couldn't see the way out and it was pressure. But instead of running, I leaned into it. It was like my biggest, one of my biggest life lessons. It was like this, some spiritual thing I just connected to. So that's what I do today. No matter whatever happens, I lean into it. If something ever happens, if, man, if God forbid someone died that I love, it's part of the process. And there's just so much peace where you just you embrace the pain. Embrace the pain. It sounds kind of sadistic, doesn't it? But anyways, so that was a big turning point. Then I thought, I, an idea came to me at the end of my fast, and I thought, you know what? This is the answer. I'm going to go create a fund, which I had already met with some serious lawyers. And I, got, I was going to do a fund. Every single person wanted to get out of the market. So I thought, and every bit of real estate's crashing. So I started putting together a fund where I would, I would go and raise money out of, the, out of the stock market that was crashing. And I'd give them an option to buy cheap property. It'd be a joint venture. It'd be a, it'd be a limited partnership. So say about 50 people would own one big building and it would be a mutual fund, and a mutual fund eligible. Or, and, and I was, had it all set up. It was pretty smart. It would have worked. I would have gone really big. But I saw this seminar and it said, RRSP secrets. That perfect. And how to move money from RSPs to real estate. I'm like, get out of here. Cool. So I, I, I drove to Calgary, spent three days there. Now here's, the, here's kind of the cool thing about the universe, about how if you just lean into your life a little bit and let it flow, I think there's some beautiful direction you can get. That's why I'm not a big, heavy strategic planner. So I think there's a plan and then let it go and let's see where we go. But so I'm around this table and typical band for the past, I own that table. I had everyone thinking I'm amazing. Like I just like, I'd want people to put me on a pedestal. Like I wanted people to be like, wow, and I could do it. Either I would look up to people and say, oh, wow, he's so amazing. He has exactly what I don't have. And I put people on pedestals or I want people to be on my pedestal. I want people to think I'm amazing. There was no middle ground. Anyway, so I'm like owning this table and all of a sudden this guy named uh, Philip McKernan and he was teaching sales. So I was cocky, man. I'm like, I got this. But they said, what's your elevator speech? Elevator speech is what you say to someone within 30 seconds of meeting them to try to make a sale or connect. I'm like, I got this. I didn't realize how my confidence had been crushed. I was so disconnected from who I really was. I was this broken, low confidence human being. I just had this weird illusion that I was like amazing all the time. I think we all know people like that. So anyways, I stood up, because I put my hand up, I said, I got this. So I stood up and I said, okay, so what I do is I take your money and went, oh, you're going to take my money. And he just butchered me. I was so insecure. I literally jumped up and down, trying to shake it off. I'm like, this, like I just, like, it's like, I couldn't, uh, couldn't talk. I was like, what is going on? And I think that's because I was, the reality of who I was, was I was that guy. And I just wouldn't connect to it. I refused. So it is, he, the, the game that he was playing was he had this, he had this envelope that says, hey, it's $100,000. Whoever has the best elevator speech gets it. It's just a game. Anyways, he picked me as the winner because I was so terrible. Like the worst. He goes, you, you win. I thought he was a con artist, to be honest. I'm like, Fuck. Because he's like, by the way, you, win for, you, you now get to come to Vancouver to my base camp workshop. I'm like, okay. Like, and, then, and then he hands me the envelope and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a clipping of the registration form and it's like $250. I got my, fuck, I got to pay for this fucking shit? You're a, you're a, like, what a loser. Like, what a scammer, right? So anyways, I walked up to him after. I said, look, dude, I got to pay for this? He's like, no, 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 no. You're, you're free. No problem. You got two people free. Okay, cool. 
And then just out of the blue, my mother-in-law asked if Renee wanted to go, I'll take your kids. No, yeah, it's kind of different. So it was just like kind of, I was just finishing this crazy fast. Anyways, I go to this base camp and this is where everything changed to me. I saw this guy chatting and I had him way up on a pedestal. Like, oh my God, this guy. Cause he's like, you know what? I don't hang out with people. I always want to get real with people. And I always want to challenge who I am. And I'm like, I love this. Right. And in my family, it's like, man, why do you always got to challenge who you are? Like why? Like it was more of a, you're annoying. Like, why do we do this guys? And they don't like that question. Anyways, he says, you know what? Don't you dare put me on a pedestal. I've never even heard the word before. And I was like, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. Oh, shit. He's because I'm like, this guy's amazing. Oh my goodness. And my wife was kind of behind me. We're on a round circle and he starts talking to me about my life and my investors. And and I said, I'm, I'm, I don't know what to do as so I've got these investors and stuff. And he says, are your investors before your wife and kids? And Renee started bawling her eyes out at this thing. I had put all my investors so high on a pedestal that I had to like serve them and I had to blow their mind. I had to like, it was just absolutely tearing apart my family. The very thing that I thought I was helping. So it started really showing my reality of like, holy crap, my marriage sucks. My kids don't even want to be around me. I'm like, wow. So anyways, I had this moment there. And I was like, ha, ah. but guess what happens as a, this is so fucked up because, because I was raised to be scared of the devil, scared that if you don't do the right thing, the devil will get into your life. I remember my, my dad would crush up CDs that he thought were devil and put them outside. So that kind of shapes you as a kid. So have these belief systems like the devil's going to get you. Believe it or not, that's how a lot of religions are. Follow the way or else bad things happen. <laughs> so I was like, I'm an Eastern religion. Like you'd be scared of Eastern religion. I don't even know what that fuck that is. But don't, don't, don't even go there because that is the devil. Like, I just look at it now. I'm like, holy crap. Anyways, because he started talking. I'm like, is he a Christian? First question, if he's not a Christian, I can't listen to him. As if this, this weird belief system that totally held me back in life. Anyways, I'm like, F it. This guy, I know he has something that I need in my life that I've never seen ever in my life, which was, he talked about self-love, talked about personal value. Like, what is these things? You're, you can be amazing within yourself. You don't need anyone else. It's just weird, this flavor. I'm like, ah, finally someone I was looking to learn from. So I signed up for his program. Long story short, it was supposed to be a business program to take me to the next level. It wasn't. It was like business from within. It was like, we dug into our lives. What's holding you back? Why are you not successful? And it's not because of a plan. It's because of personal. What I do today is because I'm totally inspired from that. Anyways, long story short, I started walking away in, from my old belief systems. Rather, not, not that I changed my beliefs, but what I wanted to do is I thought, what if this whole Jesus thing wasn't true? Like, what if it wasn't true? Like, just imagine for a moment, everything I learned was not true. Because I thought, if I was born in another place, I'd probably be a Muslim. And I, then I find out that Jewish people, Muslim people, and Christian people pray to the same God. And I'm like, this is, this is fucked up. And I, of course, I didn't learn that in church. They say they're the way. But then you go to everyone else. I start talking to everyone. I want to know what's going on. I don't want to just adopt a set of beliefs. So I went around and talking to everyone. What do you believe? No, ours is the right way. Okay, so you're a Mormon. Yours is the right way. Okay. JWs think that Christians are going to hell and they're going to heaven. And you start looking around. I'm like, everyone believes that they've got the secret. I'm like, this is where it changes. This can't be. And I, and I love challenging my beliefs now to the core. Because here's what I did. I thought one day I was, I, don't, I, was, I was with Philip one day and I'm just like, you know what? I'm so scared. What if it wasn't true and I lived my entire life and it was wrong? I just want to know. That's all I want. Why do I have to just believe something because you told me to believe it? What if I just really believed it? I think I'd be different. I'd be confident. So what I did was I said, fuck it. I'm putting it all on the fire. I will put everything on this fire. And I, all my beliefs, everything. I'm going to burn it all. Whatever stays, I'll keep. Whatever's not, just it can go. So it's almost like I just did this restart. What do I believe? Who am I? And that's years ago. And that's when everything started changing. I started getting lucky in business. I started like coaching people. I started like, man, it was just crazy. When someone meets me, they're like, who are you? Because I've just, when you know what you believe and you walk up to someone, there is something very, there's, there's a way different energy about that. Here's a crazy thing. Now that I'm on a rant, I, I think uh, the religious people love to defend themselves. They defend themselves. This is a big part of my life. So I want to just kind of chat about it. They defend themselves. And I go, why do they got to defend them so bad? Like, like, let's look at the Bible. What's the Bible say? Like, they're just so like, there's so many people that defend what they believe. Now, here's the thing. Here's a scenario. What if, what if someone came to me and says, hey, your wife cheated. And just so you know, your boy Jack is not yours. I'd look at them and be like, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, I know it's not true. It looks exactly like me. He's got crazy curly hair. It's called a knowing versus a belief. Now, if I believed it, I'd have doubt involved. 
And then, or what if I didn't want to face reality? What if you said, I believe something, but deep down in your soul, you know you don't believe it. Now, there's some weird stuff going on there. So what happens is someone walks up to me, let's say deep down, I think my wife did cheat and I don't want to know it. I just want to live my life. I just want to go with what I'm told. I don't want to face reality. You walk up to me and go, Ben, I don't think your son is your son. Your reaction is like, what do you mean? Prove it. I'll do a DNA test right now. I guarantee he's my son. He looks like he's a, and it'd be a defensive position. Not just like, no, it's not. So there's an energy. When someone defends something, I believe they have doubt. So my theory is a lot of people are living their belief systems without, they're not theirs. That is the craziest thought. I think most people are. So that's my mission on the planet is unravel belief systems, help people believe in themselves and discover who they are. But having that as my mission, holy shit, have I found success. Man, it's like I walk into anywhere and people want to use me as a re realtor, want to coach with me. They pay me tens of thousands of dollars just to hang out. They're like, what just happened? That where I'm at today, people are wishing they could have it. The thing is, they're not willing to do the inner work. So that's business from within. The whole idea is that if you can work on yourself, discover what you believe and own that shit, it's being authentic, being who you are, lucky shit happens. Like lucky stuff happens. It's, so, so today, you know, I, I have a real estate team with, with uh, three amazing agents. I've got assistants. I've got, a, I've got a real estate coaching business. You know what's so crazy is I know what I want. You know what I want? I want to be an amazing husband. I just want to be an amazing husband. I want to be an amazing dad. Like at the end of the day, when you go to bed at night and your wife's pissed at you and your kids don't want to be around you, what, what the fuck's the whole, what are you doing? Like you're just, now this is where it's like there's this inner terror where this ego, I'm like, because I could, I could dominate. I used to be number one at everything I do. But now when you know what you want, I don't need number one anymore. You know when your realtors right now sacrifice their whole family, their whole life because that fucking number one? I know, I did it. I know I have the ability to do it. But there's something about not doing it and saying, you know what? F this. I know what I want. Don't even put me on the list. I don't want it. Because I go home, I get to go see my son's hockey game. I get to go speak all over the country whenever I want. I say no to more opportunities and I say yes, because I know what I want and I know who I am. So you got to know who you are and then you'll find out what you want. And then it's like, literally the universe is, you have it all. Problem is why you'll get lucky, the why good things don't happen all the time is because you don't know what you want. You're living someone else's life. So it's almost confuses the universe. You say, well, I'm trying to give you what you want, but it's not coming. Anyways, my biggest thing is you got to challenge everything you believe, every single thing you believe. Now, when you go within, it's like, who am I? All these questions. I don't know why business books, I think it's changing. It should be how, how to market like a genius, but you can't just have that. You got to go, who are you? Does this align to you? Does this marketing align to you? How many, how many agents and how many business people are doing marketing that has nothing, they don't even believe in it. So they're not taught to listen to their soul, to listen to this voice that says, don't do it or do it. Like there's three or four people that want to be on my team. Don't, don't feel it. Don't feel it. I fired three assistants and now I've got the best one ever because I'm just listening. There's something about just, and then all of a sudden when you start making good calls and you believe in yourself, you just go, I can do this. There's something about it. I don't think the most successful people are the smartest. I don't. I think they're, they know what they want and they're relentlessly going toward it and the universe just kind of helps them. I know now it's totally abstract, but anyways, I'm so excited about being able to talk about this stuff. I think that the inner person is so hidden. What you, who you are behind the scenes is not allowed to come out. So then that's okay. We'll just be fake all our lives. But at the end of the day, we don't like fake people, but I'm not willing to be real. Guess what happens when you're being willing to be real is that you will absolutely alienate yourself from your network. The people that will stay with you, just like burning, the, burning that faith and all my beliefs, I lost people. I didn't talk to my mom and dad for two years. They said I was in a cult, but now I'm coming back to them with confidence. Now they're seeing this crazy confident guy, guy that the, the kids just love hanging out with me. I don't talk to the point where no one can understand because I was so fast and so hyper. But there's a calmness about me. I can understand. I have so much empathy for people. I have insight. My parents are going, huh, well, that, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> but now we're starting to have a relationship again. So there's a chance that people will leave and come and go. But if you're not willing to lose people, like I'm willing to lose my wife. That's massive. I have to let her go. She said to me one time when I started getting into this journey, remember, she's a good Christian girl, like goody good Christian girl. Mary's this badass, which is cool, but I was a super Christian badass, kind of but I didn't know who I was. And, I was, and as soon as I, because it was almost like this hidden, it was this deal I made with her subconsciously. It says, okay, I'll marry you. <laughs> it is, and I say, this is who I am, Renee. This is who I am. She goes, okay, I like who you are. That wasn't who I am though. All of a sudden you're like, that's not who I am. Well, dude, we're being married for like nine years. That's not who you are. You told me that's who you were. Oh, that's not who I am. Sorry. Well, I didn't marry a man that wasn't going to go to church. 
Oh, 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 no. Do I honor who I am or do I just go to church? This is where it's like, you want to see how confidence has grown? Stand on your own. Stand with nobody supporting you. That's the biggest thing I've ever learned. Guess what happened? Renee was forced to look at her own beliefs because she just realized, I like this guy. I like who he's becoming. But I had to renegotiate this relationship because I had to. She wanted a Christian guy, right? That was one of her massive things. Now I'm kind of not Christian. Like it's just, that wasn't the deal. That's what happens when you start finding yourself because the person that you attract will be challenged. But then you can have the most coolest thing ever happen is now relationship is challenging each other in a way to move forward. But if one person doesn't want it, it's very difficult. And then you might have to let them go. But I can let my wife go. It's not been easy. Our marriage has been very difficult. It's been so many highs. But the, the battles and our own insecurities, my anger, my temper, my, my inability to listen, like there's so many different things, which again, those are things that were sabotaging my business constantly. I wasn't listening to someone. I thought I was the fucking man. You know, people, you know, people are always like that. This is ego driven. I just knew I was good inside. So I was just, I'm relentless. If I can find something, do you know how exciting it is to get onto the other side of, go from super insecure to like knowing what you want and having cool shit happen. Once you experience that, it's like, you, it's just like, you just want more. And you're like, where else could I go? And now it's like, once you believe in yourself, which by the way, I grew up in my life that that was sacrilegious. Like it, it's so polarizing. It's like, you believe in Jesus, you don't believe in yourself. It's actually related back to the Garden of Eden where the woman ate the tree because the tree of life would give you all the knowledge. No, no, that's God's knowledge. Don't eat that. So then if you believe in yourself, you're actually believing Satan's lie. Like so fucked up. It's so crazy. If you believe that shit, you watch how your life turns. It's going to be fearful. It's going to not be happy. You'll probably be financially very poor because it's a very poverty stricken mentality. You can still believe in Christianity and God. But the thing is, find out if it's yours. I'm just saying, believe in what you want to believe, but make sure it's yours. That's all I ask. This is the inner work that has to be done. Anyways, you got to be able to stand on your own. That's one of the biggest things I've ever learned with, with my marriage and, and even with my kids. You got to let go of the kids. Anyways, I've learned so much. So I don't know how to wrap this up, but this is a first chat. It's pretty freaking deep. There's only one way I go. It's real. Uh, I share shit that's probably not allowed to share, which is awesome. I scare myself sitting in here. I was so nervous to even talk, but I don't care. People need permission to be themselves and I will be that guy. I will say the shit that no one else wants to hear. I will say this shit because one out of 10 say, I want to, I want to break out. I want to be who I'm designed to be. Anyways, cheers. Thanks guys. Hi guys. Thanks so much for listening to business from within episode one. I got real, real, real fast. I don't do things small at the end of the day. Why are we even doing podcasts? Is this to create an audience, leverage it, product, productize it, and sell to you and squeeze you for your money? No. This is 100% to challenge the status quo on how we do business because you know what? You can become really, really successful. You can become very rich quite easily nowadays with all the amazing business systems that are out there. And I love that stuff too. But the reality is the person running these businesses, the person behind the strategies, this is the one thing that I find is missing. If you're very, very successful and your marriage sucks, your relationships suck, your, your family doesn't want to talk to you, you're not spending time on your own, you're not enjoying the things of life that you love, what the frick is the point? Guys, this is what it is, business from within. I want to get a, a real look at what's affecting us going forward, how we self-sabotage. It may sound like a negative thing, but I'll tell you, this is the pathway to breaking into a hyper level of success. Then we'll talk about all kinds of business stuff. I'm going to interview guys that are, that give me a surprise who comes on this podcast because you're going to see here stories that you thought, you know what, they got their shit together and they are mega successful, but you know what? We want to hear how they had to overcome themselves. What's their self-sabotage? What had to shift for an emotional, a mindset, a spiritual set for them to find that success? Guys, honestly, share this away. I'd love for you to help me get this going. It's kind of a mission for me. This is me stepping into my passion. I just want to share my heart. At the end of the day, it's going to be interviews. It'll be sometimes five-minute inspirational hits. You know what? Love to hear. Love to talk to you. Love the feedback. Please share and like it on iTunes or whatever that means. Talk to you later. Cheers.